Michael, I think one of the biggest problems is, is we, we live in an age of what I call emotional incontinence, which means that people cannot put their feelings, emotions, and biases in check for long enough to have a discussion, let alone reach any type of mutual solution. Hey everyone, welcome to another sit down with Michael Francis. Hope everybody is doing well. All is very good, very blessed on this end. And as always, we give God all the praise, honor and glory and thanksgiving for that. Today I'm sitting down with a young man that I've been really enthusiastic about sitting down with. His name is Zuby. I'm sure many of you know who he is. He's got a pretty big social media following. He was a rapper, a clean rapper, by the way, also a big podcaster. He was born in England. He was uh, spent a lot of time in Saudi Arabia, went to the university. And the reason I was enthusiastic about speaking with him is because he's very intelligent. He has a, a good worldview, a good perspective on a lot of the issues that we're facing today. Uh, he's interviewed Andrew Tate, very, very interesting interview. If you haven't seen it, I would advise that you watch it. But he's just got a well thought out, very balanced, very good perspective on life. And I think this young man is going to go far. He's already accomplished a lot. And I had a, a great you know, opportunity to meet with him and speak with him. So hope you enjoy the interview. Here we go. Zuby. Zuby, what a pleasure having you on. I have to say this. I have been uh, watching you, you know, most recently. I saw a couple of your interviews and I've been uh, very much looking forward to sitting down with you because I just love your perspective on so many things. You know, uh, one of the things that we're lacking today, I think, in many of our, you know, people that are out there and in the public eye is a, a very balanced, um, intelligent perspective on so many of the issues that we're all facing. And in many of the issues that you spoke about, uh, I just got that sense from you. You just have a great perspective on, on things that are going on in life that are very important. And people need to hear that. So I'm excited to have you on, excited for my viewers to, uh, uh, to get to know you and, and hopefully follow you from this point on. I know you have a pretty big following already, but hey, it always helps to have a few more people listening in, right? Well, thank you, Michael. I appreciate that. And uh, I look forward to the conversation. And what I'd like to do now, I'm sure many of my viewers know who you are, but for those of uh, them that don't, maybe you can give me a little bit of your background. Just tell us how you get started. I know you're into a bunch of things and uh, where you came from, where you're going, and we can start like that. Absolutely. So my name is Zuby. I'm an independent rapper, author, host of the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. I also do public speaking around the world, and I coach people as well in various things. I am I have an eclectic background. My family is originally from Nigeria. Both my parents are Nigerian, but I myself was born in the UK. I grew up in the Middle East in Saudi Arabia, moved there when I was a baby, and I went to school there until fifth grade. When I was 11 years old, I went to boarding school in the UK. So I was back and forth between the two countries, UK and Saudi Arabia, multiple times a year, traveling internationally by myself from the age of 11. Did seven years in boarding school. I was a very good student, got top grades in every single subject, got into Oxford University, and I went there and studied computer science. And when I was at university, that's when I first started rapping. I actually released my first album, Commercial Underground, when I was still in university. And that's what set off, set off the spark of what would go on to become my career. After university, I worked in the corporate world for a couple of years. And then in November 2011, I took the plunge and went full-time with my music. So from 2011, I've been on this journey. I've added a lot of additional strings to the bow, especially over the last four years. That's when I started my podcast, wrote and released my first book in 2019, and really started to grow on social media and become known. I don't know, different people describe me in different ways, sociocultural, political commentator. Some people consider me some type of modern day philosopher or Renaissance man, but the ultimate goal of what I do has not changed, and that is to 
seek to positively inspire and motivate millions of people through my words and my actions. That's why I wanted to become a full-time musician to begin with. And I still do that. I still do it through my music. And I've just added more stuff to the toolkit. Well, I can certainly say that you're uh, you're having success in that regard. You're very well spoken, and you have a very balanced uh, perspective on things. And just curious, uh, you know, growing up in Saudi Arabia and then in the United Kingdom, how much of an impact did that have on your worldview, your upbringing? It must have been tremendous. Yeah, it had a lot. It's an interesting question because I think it's difficult for any of us to know exactly how and why we think the way that we do and we have the perspectives we do. Obviously, there's a combination of both nature and nurture in there, depending on what city or country you grow up in, who your parents are, what you're exposed to, and and so on. I think it was a massive blessing for me to be, from a very young age, just to be surrounded by such a broad range of people. So even in terms of the countries and cultures I was exposed to, there were four main influences in terms of nations. So of course, living in Saudi Arabia, but being British, going to an American school and living with lots of Americans and Canadians and people from all over when I was in Saudi Arabia. Um, and then of course the, uh, which one, which one have I missed here? Nigeria, UK, USA, and Saudi Arabia, those four countries all influenced me very, very heavily since I was young. And then I've also been blessed to be able to travel to many dozens of countries beyond that as I've, as I've grown up. And from day one, honestly, I mean, if you were to see a picture of my preschool class when I was like four years old, you will just see a mix of all sorts of different people, kids from different races, ethnicities, family backgrounds, religions, all sorts. So I've always just seen people as people. Does that make sense? Uh, I never kind of got into this framework of being isolated or only surrounded by people of a certain type, whether that is what they look like or their nationality or their background or anything like that, even religion. Of course, Saudi Arabia is an Islamic country. My family is Christian. I, I grew up going to church. Um, I growing, you know, I met people who were H Hindus and tons of, you know, Muslims. And so I was just surrounded from a young age by all sorts of people. And so when I look at the world or even many decades later, when I'm commenting on certain, certain things that are happening, I have a more global and holistic perspective, I guess, than the average. And I also don't have this I'd say I have a more high resolution view of the world and people within it and the nuances. So I don't really get sold on any narratives which are trying to paint entire demographics as anything good or bad. And I unfortunately have to spend quite a lot of time combating those ideas because even though we're in 2023, there's a lot of people who still get caught up in these sort of very basic fallacies, whether these are along the lines of race or gender or nationality or whatever it is. So I think all of that has helped to shape my perspective and also just given me, given me a, a great gratitude and appreciation as well for my own life and the people within it and you know what I think is important and what I don't think we should focus on so much. Well, I really appreciate that. And I want to get into that a little bit. There's a couple of topics that I want to cover and obviously, you know, racism here in the United States, um, you know, by a group of people seems to be out front in almost any issue that we have. And I'd like to hear what you have to say about that. I'll share my perspective on it. But you know, just curious, a very close relationship with your parents? Absolutely. Yeah, I speak to so them they, multiple they times a week. Big impact on your life, obviously, mom and dad. Both of them. Both of them. Yeah, they've been married almost 50 years at this point. Those are my top two role models. Whenever people ask me who my role models and influences are, they they always get the top slots. And yeah, through my childhood and now as an adult, they remain wonderful, very close relationship. Well, that's that's great to hear. And you know, I'm always a proponent. You know, one of the issues that I talk about all the time is that I think the root of some of the major problems that we have here in the United States has been the breakup of the family. And, uh, you know, I, I'm very consistent with that. I believe that with all my heart based upon my experience. So many, 
you know, speaking with so many youngsters that didn't grow up in a two-parent home, and as a result, they suffered some consequences that could have been avoided. But we can, we can get into that. But let me, what I'd like to do today, since your perspective is something that I value and have gotten to know in the past several weeks, I want to talk about some, some things that are in the news, that are in the public eye, that people are talking about quite a bit, and, uh, and people in that regard also, one of them being Andrew Tate. And I've commented a lot on Andrew. I'm going to be honest with you. We've never met personally, but we've discussed things. We've talked about it. We were going to meet before he ran into this issue. I was planning a, uh, a trip to the United Kingdom, and he and I were going to get together in Europe. And then this happened. But, you know, I have maintained, um, and sometimes I get a lot of blowback on it, um, that I thought Andrew's message was good, very constructive for our young men today, because I think we have a dearth of manhood in our young men here, especially in the United, or certainly in the United States. I'm not sure how it is in the rest of the world, but here in the United States, for sure. And I think Andrew's message was helpful uh, in, in many regards with respect to some of the men. And we see how they, the huge following that he's had. I also think that he could have been a, a bit abrasive at times to women, and if they didn't understand exactly what he was saying, it could have been misinterpreted. I'm a supporter of his. I'm a proponent of what he had to say. I, uh, I think what's going on with him is terrible. Uh, I've never heard of a situation where you can, you know, keep somebody detained without filing charges for this length of time. I've maintained that he's innocent until proven guilty, um, regardless of what he might have said that might have rubbed people wrong. And uh, I'm just hoping it works out well for him. Uh, I've commented, I actually did another video on it yesterday because there was an update on some of the things going on with him. But I'd like to, I know you sat down with Andrew. I'd like to know your perspective on him. Yeah, sure thing. So I've known Andrew to some degree since 2018. That's when we started following each other online. That's way before either of us blew up online in any regard. I think when he started following me. I probably had, I think around the time I want to say I had probably had about 16,000 followers on Twitter, something like that for perspective today, it's well over a million. And I think at the time, yeah, he maybe had a 20, 20, 30,000 followers on Twitter or something like that. And then actually he was the fourth guest ever on my podcast. So mm -hmm. January, 2019, we recorded a podcast on my, uh, on my show, real talk with Zuby. That was my first time speaking to him. And then I met him in person for the first time in Romania when I was there in 2020. We hung out a couple of times, went out for lunch together, you know, went to his house, met him and Tristan. Tristan's been on my podcast as well. So I've, I've spoken with them both. And then I saw them twice last year, both times in Dubai, actually. I was in Dubai early on in the year. And then in November, again, that's when I did that second interview with Andrew before um, all the arrest happened and all that stuff. I'm in the small category of people online who's, uh, you know, of all the people who have heard of Andrew Tate and Tristan Tate, I'm, you know, in the few people who's actually met them and, you know, spent hours with them, both online and offline and chatted with them. They've always been good to me. They've always been kind to me in terms of some of the stuff they were doing with previously with, you know, the, the webcam business and all that. Like I'm more... I'm a more socially conservative guy. I'm generally not a, a fan of that whole world and all that. And they they know that like I'm not a, that was uh never bad, but you know, they moved on and we're doing other things. So in terms of the, in terms of the current situation, I'm very much, yeah, innocent until proven guilty, uh, both even without knowing them, some of the stuff that is being said and the accusations, it doesn't really make sense or add up to me. That is my personal perspective. And then in terms of their, in terms of Andrew's overall message, I, I agree with you that to me, it's a net positive. Now people are going to agree or disagree with this. I think largely based on number one, how much they've actually listened to, uh, you know, honestly, and just sat and listened to, especially long form content, not just 10 and 20 second clips that are taken on TikTok or Instagram reels or whatever. But then also, I guess all all individuals have a different weighting that they give different things, if you, if you see what I mean. So when I say that I think that Andrew's message is a net positive, that does not mean I, as I've already said, that doesn't mean I agree with every single word that's ever come out of his mouth. Like I don't agree with all the words that have come out of anyone's mouth. But when I look at the, when I look overall on the balance, when I look at the good that is being done versus the stuff that is 
potentially, I think, you know, crossing a line or is unnecessary or, you know, might be, un, you know, un, un, unnecessarily offensive, for example, then to me, it's on the balance. To me, it's very, it's very positive. It's very positive. Um, with other people, the way they look at some of these things is that the negative, th there's some people where, you know, you can do 95 things that are positive and, or say 95 things positive and say, you know, five things that are negative, that, that they find negative. And to them, that five outweighs the other 95. And Absolutely. I can, yeah. And I can also understand where that comes from, but I'm generally a fan of doing what I call, you know, eating the meat and spitting out the bones, right? So if there's someone out there who's got a message and is saying stuff and is doing things, I'm like, look, you can, you can take the positive, take the motivation, take the inspiration, take the stuff that you find helpful and use that, you know, spit out, spit out the bones. You don't need to swallow everything. And, you know, we're, we're not these automatons where someone says something on the internet and you, you go out and you sort of repeat or do, do everything that they say. I think that's a, that's a really low resolution view. And it sort of is an infantilization of, of adults. So that that's the way that I look at it personally, because sometimes I'll, you know, I'll say that I think his overall message is a net positive and someone will send me a clip of him saying something that I disagree with and be like, oh, well, what about this? And I'm like, yeah, I don't agree with that, but that doesn't cancel out everything else, right? I can show you hours and hours and hours of stuff that's helpful, educational, inspiring, motivating, demonstrably, right? Which, which we know for a fact has positively influenced thousands, millions of people, honestly, especially young men at this stage. Now, is it correct that if your son or, or daughter or some young person is, there's some 12 year old boy and Andrew Tate is like the only man he is listening to, then that's a problem, right? Andrew Tate shouldn't be raising your children just like, I don't know, Snoop Dogg or Jay-Z should not be raising your children either. But that doesn't mean- I like mean... that, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but that doesn't mean that there's there's nothing positive that you can take out of the messaging. Um, I also do, all, I do also think that there's been a massive double standard in the way that people, uh, sort of in what people choose to be offended by. We're, we're living in this very strange- era where there's just not a lot of consistency in terms of what people are saying well, is offensive versus empowering and so well forth. well let me tell you you proved that in many ways when you did that um, deadlift you know <laughs> and, and and identified yourself as a female i mean if you want to talk about a double standard you know how women can <laughs> You know, how women could allow men to, to uh, compete in, in women's sports, is, it's insanity. It makes no sense whatsoever. I don't know how people can support that. You know, the very people that are trying to give women more prominence are actually taking them down by allowing something like that. It's such a, a contradiction. It makes no sense. Uh, and the women that are, are for it, they're remaining silent right now because so many women that are sensible are against it. And the women that afford it don't know what to say. You know, it's, it's a contradiction. It's, it's, uh, and there's so much of that going on, Zuby. I, I totally agree with you. Here in the States, yeah. it's so much of it. Yeah, it's, it's very confusing, you know, or, you know, I'm, I'm a rapper and my message is clean, positive. I don't even use profanity or anything like that. But if you're looking at not even just rap and hip hop, but mainstream rap and then also a lot of the mainstream pop music in general, and you're looking at a lot of the visuals and the lyrics and the messaging and what's being said and even how some of these people are behaving. There, again, there's this odd contradiction between, okay, for example, what was the song of the year in was it 2019? That WAP was by, by uh, Cardi B was like the number one song of the year and it won all these accolades and so on. This is literally just a woman completely, the whole song is just very vulgar, just rapping about sex. I mean, even the, the title of the song itself, <laughs> I mean, what, what it stands for. And this is like, yeah, this is awesome. This is empowering. This is pro women, da, 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 whatever. And then, I mean, I remember when I was a teenager and the things so many rappers were put on blast for was, you know, D 
degrading women or being misogynistic or having certain visuals in their songs and whatever. And now you see female artists doing the same thing or even male artists talking about all sorts of crazy stuff, you know, violence, killing people, drugs, robbing people, this and this. And that's all good. That can be on the radio. That can be everything. Oh, but we need to deplatform Andrew Tate from all social media. Exactly. You see what I mean, right? You can easily find music. You can find songs on Spotify, on YouTube, monetize everything where they're saying all sorts of crazy stuff, right? Crazy, crazy stuff, stuff far worse. Eminem, highest selling artist, highest selling rapper in the world. Mm-hmm. Is what Eminem says, is what Tate says worse than what's on some of Eminem's albums? Absolutely no, not. Right? No, absolutely. This absolutely. is what, yeah. So, so this is the thing that I mean where I say people are just not, they're not consistent in the outrage and in the offense. It's like, okay, if you're taking a conservative position and just saying, look, all of this stuff, I don't like it. It's all bad. Whether you're talking about these rappers or you're talking about certain influencers or YouTubers or this or that, and you're just very consistent. I'm like, okay, at least that person is consistent. But what I don't like is the the inconsistency and the double and triple standards of saying, oh, okay, well, this is great and this is empowering and this is positive and wonderful. Um, we can promote Lil Nas X to our children and he's got music videos where he's literally twerking on Satan and mm-hmm. he's making all sorts of nonsense songs and talking about some really degenerate stuff and promoting that, not just to adults, but also to kids. Uh, we can have super sexualized music shows and live events where kids are watching and whatever. Oh, but this guy on YouTube said the wrong word or... You know, it, that, that's the stuff that that's why I just find the whole thing quite disingenuous. Well, you know what, Zuby, it's, it's obvious to me he's gotten on the wrong side of the wrong people, you know, people that have influence and power and think a certain way. And I will tell this just to sum it up with him. Look, I have a lot of a lot of experience with a legal system, law enforcement, having been there uh, myself, you know, through countless times. And what's going on here is very suspicious because Number one, they haven't charged him yet with anything. He's been under investigation for years. They're holding him now, trying to build a case. And you can't do that in the United States. If you're arresting somebody, you've got to charge him with a certain point amount of time. So I think this is very political. There's some bias here against him and his brother. I think it's wrong. Um, again, you don't judge people by what they put on, on YouTube, not when it comes to you know, a legal issue, whether he committed a crime or not. So, and I stand by that and hopefully this is going to work out. What I'm seeing now, there's a lot of outrage from his supporters realizing that, hey, this is going on long enough. You know, I read when the judge um, actually extended another 30 days for his uh, being detained, he said they didn't show any real evidence, but there's enough to show suspicion of a crime. Well, that's not That's not a reason to hold somebody for this length of time. So the prosecution hasn't even been able to make a legitimate, valid case to the judge that's holding them. And the fact that the judge held them is very suspicious to me. I don't like it at all. But hey, you know, we wish him well. We see how it works out. And hopefully he'll he'll come out of this because the charges don't make sense to me with Andrew's position at this point in time. Just doesn't make sense. Yeah, that's that's exactly what I think as well. Well, let's move on to another serious issue here in the States, and that's uh, the Tyree Nichols situation. You know, everybody's talking about it, and rightfully so. What happened there was absolutely horrible. Uh, I don't understand what was in the minds of these five officers. Now it's gone up to seven officers that have been relieved of duty and charged with something. You know, one of the most shocking things to me, I want to get your perspective on this, is the fact that these officers had their body cams on, knew that this was being recorded. They were the ones that were videotaping it and recording it. And I'm saying, what were they thinking not to realize that this was going to be a horrible situation for them? I don't get it. I don't understand the mentality there. Uh, I'd love to hear your perspective on it. Firstly, it's sad. You know, it's, it's, it's horrible. Watching something like that is awful because it's just, it's totally unnecessary and it's depraved and it's senseless. And so it's hard for me to make sense of these things because it's very far removed from the way I think and the way that I behave. I I, I struggle to kind of put myself in those shoes and really understand 
that's that situation. It's one of those things where I think it just comes down to the depravity of the human heart and it comes down to human sin. That's really, you know, sort of ultimately what it comes down to for me. The the individuals who were involved, they clearly did not have a proper value for human life. I mean, that that's the obvious conclusion to beat someone senselessly like that, especially after he's cuffed, he's posing no threat. You know, there's police situations where it's, it's more gray and it's like, oh, you know, the person's fighting back or maybe they've got a weapon or this or that. Right. And, oh, unfortunately, sometimes in those situations, someone gets seriously hurt or someone gets killed because there is decent reason for the police to think that there is a threat on their lives. This is not one of those situations at all. It's uh, you five on one. He's not armed. He's not fighting. He wasn't swinging at people or, you know, trying to punch back. He's, he's just getting beaten, you know? And then another, th- with the, with these situations, there's always a, in my mind, there's kind of like a three part tragedy tragedy that tends to happen. There's the incident itself, which is sad and horrible and someone has lost their life. And then there is the, there's the discussion, which very quickly always devolves into tribalistic nonsense. It involves into people yelling about racism, even silly situations like this, where everyone involved is of the same color and screaming about left versus right and Democrats versus Republicans. And this, it, you know, people want to immediately use capitalize on the tragedy for their own political or activist aspirations, which is the second tragedy. And it's gross. I think it's very tasteless. And then the third part is that because of all the distraction, long-term, nothing tends to actually be done, which is why these scenarios keep happening again and again and again. And I honestly don't think that this is going to stop happening or significantly decrease until people are willing to come to the table and have a real and honest discussion, right? Put away the tribalism, put away the partisan politics, put away, you know, wanting to blame everything on your favorite um, pet, (laughs) pet conclusion for every issue, whether it's, it's white supremacy or it's, you know, whatever it is, and just speak really honestly and work out some of the solutions here because very obviously this is a it's a police issue right there the guys who did this should not have been police officers clearly right in right. terms of their character in terms of their qualifications their training i don't know all the ins and outs of how the memphis police trains its officers i know that they've dropped the bar recently and i've heard that two of the at least two of these officers involved were actually uh, recruited after they lowered the standards significantly for what it takes to be a police officer in the city. And so every city, every state, every county, they're all going to, I don't, I don't know all the ins and outs of all these different police departments. There's going to be different problems, but some of the obvious solutions to me lie in terms of who is being recruited and how they are being trained and incentivized. Um, And until we can have that conversation, instead of just people shouting at each other about Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter and Black and white and systemic and racism and white supremacy and this and all these, what I consider red herrings, right? Just just distractions, which get away from the main point. And the next thing you know, that's all everyone is even talking about. They're not talking about the issue at hand anymore. And to me, that's the third tragedy. And it's a tragedy because it means, sadly, this is going to happen again, right? You didn't get the solution. You got distracted. So, oh, it happens again. Step two, people start screaming at each other again. Step three, nothing happens, happens again. And this has been going on for decades at this point. No, you're right in everything that you said. And, you know, I'll take you back on this. I'll give you my perspective. The solution is not difficult. It's, it's fairly obvious. If you go back to the George Floyd situation here, which was another horrible one, I will admit to one thing, there could have been racism involved in that. It was a white cop with a black guy. Um, It could have been, we don't know for sure, but it's possible. Possible. Yeah, I mean, racism does exist. 
sorry to jump in. What is interesting is in that whole trial, that was never brought up by the prosecution, was it? And no, it wasn't. You're right. Which is interesting. But, but here's the thing, a couple of things. You know, I counsel a lot of young men also. I go into prisons, detention centers, spent a lot of time. And I tell them, listen, guys, I've been arrested 18 times in my life. And each time I was being arrested, I did one thing. I held out my hands. They put the handcuffs on. I got in the car. We went through the process. It makes no sense to try to run because you're not going to win. You're going to lose. And these things happen as a result of that. That's number one. But forgetting that for a second, after that incident, it was very obvious. We absolutely do need police reform in this country. I agree with that. It, it should be a nationwide thing that we need to do. But what happened after that, immediately racism became the main issue. And that's all people wanted to talk about, rather than try to fix the problem and find a solution. And I find that very, very offensive because, again, you're masking the real problem. They went on to this big defund the police movement. And what happened is, as we can see all over the country, um, crime has risen to a tremendous rate in Seattle and Portland and Los Angeles and New York and Chicago, which is a, a, a war zone right now. So they never got to the problem. To defund the police is absolutely insane. Uh, I just don't understand where people, where they're coming from, what they're thinking of without providing a very viable solution. And honestly, there is none. You got to have law enforcement. And it's offensive to me that race always becomes the issue and clouds the real effort to find a solution to the problem. And even here, uh, Tyree, I don't know if you're paying attention to this, but so many people on the left are injecting r racism into this situation which means that there again, are we gonna find a solution? It's obvious that police department needs reform. And you said it uh, in one of your interviews, uh, good cops all over the country have been retiring early and nobody wants to join the police force anymore because the morale is so low, so they're getting people in there that are not really qualified, haven't been trained properly because they do not need to have bodies on the street. And as a result, the problem is getting worse. And so what do we do to fix this? You know, I have an idea that's, that's probably very difficult to implement. It would probably never happen because of the way the world is today. But w what's your thoughts on that? Michael, I think one of the biggest problems is, is we, we live in an age of what I call emotional incontinence, which means that people cannot put their feelings, emotions, and biases in check for long enough to have a discussion, let alone reach any type of mutual solution. And to me, it's, it's immaturity. It's immaturity. When I'm just seeing people online or offline, just yelling and screaming back and forth on this and just getting, getting lost in the weeds, I'm just like, what is, what's wrong with people? Because the thing is, if you go up a level on most issues, that is where you find the point of agreement. Okay. So people you know, on, the, on the left or on the right or of this race or that right, right people might disagree on to what degree they think racism or institutional racism, systemic discrimination, however they want to phrase it, people are going to disagree on how much they think that plays a role in these police situations, right? We know that statistically, every single year, the police across the USA kill more white people than yes. they do black people. They kill disproportionately as a percentage of the population, more black people. There's more police in incidents that involve black people as well, so on and so forth. And you've also, of course, got <laughs> these are not the only two uh, two classes of people. Um, and so people look people are people are going to differ on what they think with that. Some people are going to say, you know, I 100% believe the George Floyd Derek Chauvin incident was racism. Other people are going to say, you know what, it you know both people agree it was effed up, but. One thinks it was racism, one doesn't. It, okay, the Tyree Nichols one, whatever. All these different situations that you can name or all the ones that aren't even publicly. But what does everyone actually agree on? Everyone agree that that was wrong and that should not have happened. That man should not have lost his life life like that, right? Those police were in yes. the wrong. This was a, That's where everyone agrees. But when you go too far down the rabbit hole, you get stuck on all of the disagreements. So this is why even a lot of the Black Lives Matter activism I find irritating because it initially is divisive, which prevents people from coming to the table, right? Once people are arguing about whether it's Black Lives Matter or it's All Lives Matter, you're, you're lost. You're in the weeds. You're in the weeds, 
right? Because both groups actually believe the same thing, right? No one is saying that black people's lives don't matter. No one is saying that everybody's life doesn't matter. You're actually all, you're all in agreement. But if you could just take this conversation up a level and get to the point of, is there anyone out there like, you know, is there anyone out there who wants more police brutality? No, right? On the right, no. On the left, no. Democrats, Republicans, no. Everyone agrees, all right. No one wants more police brutality. Is there anyone who wants more innocent people dying at dying period or dying at the hands of least? No, absolutely not. We don't want that, right? Does Does everyone... I mean, you might get 1% disagreement on this from crazies, but does everyone agree that we should have, we, we do need law enforcement and that the law and people who are responsible for this should be well-trained and should be decent people? Yes, agreement all around. Okay, cool. Rather than let's getting lost in the systemic racism conversation and in this and in this, let's have that conversation, right? Let's find the points of agreements. And then look, people are going to, people are of course going to have different ideas. This person may think you need more funding. This person may think there's enough and it's going to the wrong areas. This person may think that certain, um, you know, the, the, all the, I don't know all the intricacies of police training. I don't know how long it should be. I don't know exactly what it should consist of. I don't know all that, but there are experts in all of these fields and you can look in places where it's working well and copy what is working well. And I just think that's the type of, that's the level the conversation needs to happen at. But what happens is that people have their, you have activists and you have, manipulative politicians and you have the media that wants to stir it up and divide people and they keep dragging the conversation into the weeds. And the truth is our brains are only able to sort of handle so much at once. If your brain is distracted by this conversation about black lives matter and all lives matter and systemic racism and unconscious bias, if your brain is occupied by that, it's not focused on police training and funding and how we can actually improve certain things and certain things that could maybe be put in place to have safeguards. I know some people talk about qualified immunity, all of these things, all of this should be brought to the table. It should be weighed up. It should be discussed like adults. I think that if, and when that could happen, we could actually move forward on these things. And I, I, it, it never happens after all these years of my life, it doesn't happen. It's just the same cycle. It repeats and repeats. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. And, you know, I will say this, when uh, the Black Lives Matter group was formed, I thought that could have been a step in a positive direction. I said, hey, this is good. You know, maybe this could be an organization that can try to see what the root of the problem is. Uh, but then I got disillusioned with it, obviously, when I heard certain things and I saw inaction. Um, and one of the things, I'll be honest with you, I, I sent word to them. I said, listen, I am... Uh, deeply troubled about what's going on in Chicago. I know a lot of these killings are gang related. I happen to have an influence with these gangs. I've been speaking to them for years and I kind of respect my background where I came from. Let's go in there together and let's grab a hold of these groups. There's also a big church there uh, that I'm affiliated with that um, has a lot of influence. I said, we can use the church as a neutral ground. And let's get some of the people and some of the leaders of some of these gangs and let's get them together and talk to them and, and try to find a solution. I sent word out to them two or three times, never got a response. So that, you know, disillusion with the organization. But I, I agree 100% with what you're saying. And, you know, listen, there's going to, racism has existed since the beginning of time, and it's going to continue to exist. We're not going to put it to bed and resolve it to any great degree ever, I think. I don't believe this. I don't think this country is a racist country. I, I, I feel that way. Do, do you know what I honestly believe, Michael? I, I believe that racism has been on life support for decades at this point. I think it's been I, on I life. I think, I think it's been on life support. It's met. It's, it's not dead, but it's, you know, it's had 95, 99% of the wind taken out of its sails. But unfortunately there are individuals and I'm just going to straight up say it. There are politicians, there are people in the media and there are activists who are out there who want and need racism to exist. They're incentivized for it to exist. If it doesn't exist, they no longer have their power or their financing or their careers or anything like that. That's why they're so desperate for that racism narrative. It's why they push it all the time. Even when it's totally irrelevant, they're talking about climate change and they bring in white supremacy. You're talking about obesity. They're talking about racism. They're bringing in police brutality and they're talking about 
you know, institutional, like they, they, everything to them, all roads lead to racism. And it has to, because that is how they're incentivized. So I, I think those individuals, I think that needs to be called out for what it is. There are individuals out there who do not actually want the problem to be fully resolved. The worst thing that could happen for them is everyone actually truly stops caring about other people's quote unquote race. That would be the worst thing for them because they've built their whole careers off of the existence of this boogeyman. So if you take the boogeyman away, or if you even tell people, you know what, okay, the boogeyman exists, but he's not this giant monster. He's like a little goblin. And, you know, maybe you'll never get rid of the little goblin because you can't control the human mind in such a way. But if you look back, I mean, let's just go back a hundred years ago. I mean, in 1923, I know, you know we weren't around at that time, but look at the progress that's been made in one human lifespan, right? I think at the peak, if you were talking about the USA, I believe at the peak, if I remember correctly, I don't want to misquote the statistic. I think at the peak, the Ku Klux Klan had over 4 million members at its peak, 4 million members. And that's members. That's not just people who are sympathetic to the cause. They had people in Congress. They had governors. They had police, chief, police chiefs. They had Congress. Like, that's crazy. I mean, can you, can you even imagine someone, for all this talk of racism and white supremacy, can you imagine a Republican or a Democratic candidate <laughs> running off of a platform of racial segregation or white supremacy? Like, it wouldn't even be, you can't even fathom it. Whereas less than literally 60 years ago, that was, that was the case, right? That, that, was, that was the situation. So I think something that would actually help a lot of these conversations would be this sense of perspective and to recognize, look, not everything is perfect, right? Not everything is perfect. There are still some of these isms and phobias. There are still people with some bigoted views. There are certain things that are unfair and which we want to work on. But can we take a moment and appreciate how far how far along we've come and how much progress has been made. I mean, that's just going back 100, 150 years ago, let alone all the other thousands of years of human history where people were enslaving each other for thousands of years and doing human sacrifices and doing all this awful, brutal stuff. I mean, you look at history, it's like, good grief. Like what was, you, you look at it and it's like, what, what was wrong with people? And so I, I think it's good to have this desire to want to make society better I think that's a very positive inclination, but I think that people need to temper that with perspective and gratitude so that we don't, you know, put the pedal down so hard that, you know, we just career off a cliff rather than slowly, you know, slowly approaching the station that we should be stopping at. Well, Zuby, I think you nailed it. I really, I really mean it. I, I don't think I, I've heard it stated any better than what you just did. And I, I never thought of it that way, but racism being on life support and the need for people to uh, continue to play that game because they need to, uh, you nailed it. And you know, it brings me to another subject. I, I have never in my 71 years on this earth see, seen the amount of divisiveness that we have in this country. And I have told people all the time, I said, listen, this comes from the top and it trickles down. When we see our leaders constantly at each other's throats, calling each other names, acting so uncivil in many ways, I said, it trickles down. It starts at the top and all of a sudden it permeates throughout all of our citizens and throughout the country. And I think we have a real dearth of leadership in this country, really. And I, you know, I'll say it, I was a Donald Trump supporter. I was a supporter of his policies. I try to make people understand that. And I even joke, I said, listen, I wouldn't invite him over to have a date with one of my daughters. I'm not saying we're going to be best friends. I said, that's immaterial to me. What matters to me is his policies and how he runs this country for the benefit of all Americans. I said, so in that regard, I was a supporter. However, I thought he was very divisive. I thought he wasn't presidential uh, quite often because the way he responded to certain attacks and critics of him, he didn't need to do that. He could have you know, been above the fray and not acted like that. And I think if he had, he might still be president. But uh, we see it on both sides, extremely divisive. And unfortunately, you know, today it takes so much money to get into a, a position of leadership in this country that I think good people shy away from it or they just can't, you know, you know uh, uh, compete with others financially. Uh, what is your feeling about that? I mean, I've, I've never seen this country in such bad shape, and uh, that's not a good thing to say, but 
I'm being honest about it. Yeah, sure. I, I think a few different things. So firstly, in terms of the, the polarization within the USA, I think actually it's, I do think it's overblown. I think it's exaggerated. And the reason why I say this is because in the real world, when I travel around the US, different cities, different states, interacting with different people, just going about, going to restaurants, going to the gym, whatever, in airports, everyone gets along. Everyone's getting, getting along fine. There's no problem. There's no, there's no people uh, having some race war. There's no, I don't know who's a Democrat. I don't know who's a Republican, left and right out fighting each other. Right? I think you, you go online and it's chaos. Right. You go on Twitter, like, whoa, you know, it's chaotic. YouTube, it looks chaotic, all this stuff. But then, you know, I look up from my screen. Right. It's, it's funny. I have moments. I spend a lot of time in airports and I can be in an airport and I'm kind of going through my social media feeds and I'm seeing all the craziness. And then I look up and I'm like, everyone is, everyone is you don't see that not 99.9% .9 of people are just living their life. They're getting on with each other, even in the places that people are calling war zones. I've been to Chicago recently. I've been to Los Angeles recently. I've been to New York recently. I've been to San Francisco recently. All the places that people consider, you know, some of the worst ones. And I'm like, it's fine. <laughs> you know, you, you, you kind of see what I mean? Like, it's, it, it's fine. You're at the beach. You're at whatever. So are there concerns? Absolutely. Is there some polarization? Absolutely. Do I think that there's going to be some like civil war or something? N no, I don't. And I, I think the reason why this happens is actually twofold or maybe, maybe threefold. I think number one, we have so much access to information now. So we hear everything and we see everything. If some crazy incident happens, I mean, perfect example, Michael, think, think of, and I, I was in the UK at the time, the, the situation that happened with George Floyd in 2020. Okay. It's actually a function of technology and social media and the way that things are now that it blew up nationally and internationally in the way that it did. I was in the UK. There's people having Black Lives Matter protests in London and in Birmingham and in Southampton because a man in Minneapolis, Minnesota was killed. There's protests happening in New Zealand. In the past, for better or for worse, that story would not have even been international news. How did we even see the video? We saw the video because everyone now has camera phones. So someone is able to put, watch, video it and post it. And there's some good in that, right? It's good that we can hold police accountable because you can see the actions and so on. But the problem with this is that every single incident, whether it's major or minor, you, you now see it, right? And just by definition, if something makes the news or it's going viral, it's not normal right? It's not, it's not the norm. If it was an everyday occurrence, it wouldn't be going viral. If it were right. an everyday, right? You never see a viral video of just like, you know, police being nice to people and not, not harass, <laughs> right? You, you, you don't see, you, you don't see, right. yeah, no, normal life doesn't make the news. Normal life doesn't go viral. So something crazy can happen today in, um, I don't know, in Seattle and within minutes, you're aware of it in California. I'm aware of it where I am, people in the UK, people in Australia, people in Nigeria, everyone knows about it and everyone's talking about it. This can even be single individual altercations. Let, let's give another example. I don't know if you remember a couple of years ago, I think it was in New York. You remember there was that, um, there was that, there was that white lady who had the altercation with the black guy. And she said, I don't know if she like threatened to call the police on him. Oh yeah. Right. Yes. Everyone around the world, hundreds of millions of people saw that. This was just in, in a park in New York City. Nobody, nobody actually got hurt. Like not, there wasn't actually, right? It was just this exchange. Right. Just and, an exchange. Yeah. And, and there's this global internet, right? There's think pieces in UK media. There's this and that. I'm like, man, if that happened in 1995, <laughs> that would have just been. It would have been oh, nothing. It, no one would have known about it. And so I think that's a factor. I think the second one, and this is linked to the first, is that the, the power of social media makes, it, it can create this distortion effect where it can make rare things or small percentages of people look much bigger than they are, right? So people who really buy into what, what, what's called, what we call the woke ideology, right? Like the, the real hardcore, like fully, fully deep into it. I would wager that that's under 2% of the US population. But when you're online, it can be made to look like 20, 30, 
it can be made to look like a huge number of people because you're getting this distortion again, right? Um, what percentage of the US population is even on Twitter, right? And the people who are on it, it's not a fully representative um, display of the of the nation as a whole. So I think these I think these distortion effects matter a lot. And I think for people like ourselves, for example, because we are in the world of new media, we're doing podcasts, we're doing YouTube videos, we're there on social media, we're there keeping up with all of this stuff happening. So I think we're even more sensitive to it because you just see so much, there's just so much information and it can paint this picture as if like, oh my gosh, everyone's at each other's throats. Nobody's getting on. There's all these problems. There's going to be a civil war, whatever. But I don't think that is the, I, I honestly don't think that's the reality. And hopefully that gives people some optimism because I know a lot of people do really, really worry about this stuff. But I think when you kind of take that step back and you zoom out and you sort of exist and observe the real world, and, and then you kind of see that actually people are, people are just going about their lives and Sure, things are not perfect, as we said before, but they're still pretty good. Things are working pretty well. And, um, you know, we might be in an economic downturn right now, but in the grand scheme of things, compared to what humans have dealt with in the past, we've got it pretty good. Well, yeah, I, I share that perspective, you know, and just to, uh, you know, to further that conversation a little bit, I travel around to a public speaker. I share my testimony a lot in churches and various ministries. And although I think, you know, most of the people I speak to take a conservative, uh, you know, they're, they're conservatives in their ideology, but many of them are Democrats. And, you know, the, the point is, back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, even in the early 80s, uh, there wasn't much of a difference between Democrats and Republicans, people on the street. Their ideology, you know, they differed in little ways, but everybody got along. They all wanted the same things, food on their tables, protection, safe streets, the whole thing. And, and I agree with you. And I think to a large part, that's how people are today. I think it gets crazy. You're right. With, the, with so much information coming out, and a lot of that information comes out with somebody's perspective that may have an ulterior motive, like you said earlier, you know, to, uh, to um, support whatever position that they might have. And yeah, it tends to incite people and, and, and get people agitated. But I, I agree with you, you know, and I wanted to ask you this. I know we're both Christians. How outspoken are you about your faith? Are you, is it something that you're, uh, the reason I'm asking you this is because a lot of times I'll talk about my faith I don't push it on anybody. I'm not trying to turn anybody into a Christian. I don't impose my faith, but it's part of who I am. And we know as Christians, uh, we're obligated to share our faith whenever we can, whether it be in our actions or our words. And so I do that because that's my obligation. Uh, how do you feel about that? And how do, how do people um, react to that? Yeah, I, I agree with you. A anyone who follows me properly, listens to my podcast, follows me on social media, even listens to my music, knows that I'm a Christian. I'm very open and comfortable about talking about it. I don't tend to lead with it, if you see what I mean. So I don't tend yeah. to, I wouldn't describe myself, for example, as a Christian rapper or as a Christian content creator, or as a, you know, I, I wouldn't use the prefix per se, but if someone asks me what my views are on something, or if I'm giving my take on something and it's relevant to the subject, or someone wants to really go deep on my beliefs and why I believe what I believe, then I'm absolutely, I'm, 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 I'm proud. I'm proud to be a Christian. Um, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. And the reason why actually I don't tend to lead with it is, I, I guess it's twofold. Um, and some of this comes back to me, you know, starting out really ju just doing music. Number one is that I don't want to, um, how would I put it? I, I don't want to box myself in creatively because I talk about a lot of stuff. I do a lot of stuff and I talk about a lot of stuff. I, I wear many different hats and I don't want to say even just in the world of music, right? I think if I def describe myself explicitly as a Christian rapper, then I'd feel like every single song that I make has to have a gospel element to it, right? I could make a song and I'm like, ah, I haven't mentioned Jesus in this one. Like I haven't met, right. You know, I haven't quoted any Bible verses and it's, it's almost like a restriction on my own creativity. So I, I like the ability to, cool. I can make, I can make this song. I can make that song, whatever, especially if people listen to whole bodies of work, they're going to understand where I come from, what I believe. And then also 
I, I don't want to, you know, I want to inspire and motivate as many people as I reasonably can whilst staying true to my beliefs and my ethics. And I, I think that certain labels can sort of close the door on people just right off the bat, if you see what I mean. So again, if, if you brand, if you brand yourself in a certain way, then someone who isn't already of your faith or of your belief system might just think, oh, that's not for me, right? Oh, this is a Christian YouTube channel. Uh, I'm not a Christian, so I'm not going to listen to it. Oh, this is a Christian, this is a Christian rock song, or this is a gospel. Oh, uh, that's not, you know, that they, they, they immediately will kind of not come into the fold because they just think that's not, that's not for them. Um, and I'd rather cast the net wide and then be able to help people in various ways with some people. If that has an element of faith or religion to it, fantastic. If it's someone who's just like, Hey, cool. I helped that atheist get in better shape. Fantastic. You know, I helped this uh, Hindu person or this Muslim think more critically about that issue. Fantastic. Oh, I inspired this person of whatever faith or whatever belief system to uh, become an entrepreneur and to, to go after their, whatever, right? As long as I'm able to help inspire and motivate people, then to me, that's me very much on my mission. I believe that's the purpose that God has put me here for. I'm still a young man. Later down the line, if I feel, uh, you know, if I, if I have a calling to sort of lead, lead with that more, then I, I will, I will do that at the time. But as it currently stands, um, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm open about my faith, happy to discuss it with people, explain why I believe what I believe, but I don't have the, you know, I do believe that people are called for different, for different purposes. I believe, I believe, you know, as a Christian, I believe God puts us here and gives us different experiences and personalities and skills, skill sets and skill stacks to, you know, not, not for us all to do the same thing. There are people who are on this earth to be missionaries, right? Like that's, that's their thing. That's their calling. That's what they're passionate about. They're traveling the world. They're day in, day out. That's, that's what they do. God bless them. That's amazing. Some people are, are called to ministry. Some people are called to, you know, play, play in the church band. Other people are called to be business leaders and to other people are called to be uh, artists or to be YouTubers or whatever it is. And so I, I, yeah, that's, that's my thing. I feel like this is my, I'm doing my best to live my, live my role and live my purpose. And the, the, the thing that even motivates me to do this is actually largely driven by my faith. Um, it certainly helps to temper a lot of potential excesses. It helps me to, I genuinely view every other human being as made in the image of God. And that is something that actually, I, I get so many people who are mad, dude, like, how do you even keep your cool in some of these conversations you have or dealing with certain, certain trolls on the internet or this or this, right? People see all this stuff thrown at me. Like, how do you even, how can you even deal with people like that? It's, it's deeply, actually, it's because it, it's because I recognize that no matter how ideologically opposed to someone I'm, I, I might be or how annoying they are or whatever it is, how much I disagree with them, I still believe that that is a human being worthy of respect whose life matters, who's made in the image of God and who has potential. Maybe they're not living up to their potential at all, but it's still there. And so that sort of through line is something that allows me to sort of keep a cool, a, a, a cooler head in some of these situations and to not go personal. You'll, you'll notice I, I never attack individuals. I never just like go at somebody and just pile on them or I could do it, right? Sometimes it's a temptation, especially having a big following. <laughs> Sometimes it's a temptation, man. Like, let me just, let me just, let me just go, you know, they, they said this nasty thing to me. Let me just go at them. And I'm like, no, let me, let me not do that. You know, let me not do that. And yeah, that's, uh, that's my approach to it. Well, let me tell you again, Zuby, we agree 1000%. You know, I don't think you should be known as a Christian rapper or a Christian anything. You know, you are Zuby and there's people that you can reach that if right away, if they would have thought you were a Christian, they would have turned you off just because of what they feel about Christianity. I have the same thing. People tell me all the time, Michael, you can reach to people that we wouldn't be able to get to because of your background. 
you know, you'll be able to reach out to them. And then once they understand that you're a Christian, where you're coming from, well, that could be very attractive. It could might even lead them to Christ. So I, I agree with you a thousand percent on that. And you're doing a, a great job in that regard. And, and um, you know, I just really hope you continue and you continue with your success. What do you got coming up? Anything special? Anything we should know about? Yeah, thanks, Michael. I, I appreciate those words. So I have the stuff that's always ongoing. I, I've got nine music albums and EPs out there for anyone who wants to check out my music and more songs are going to come. I uh, have got a lot, quite a few live events lined up. I'm going to be speaking in, uh, I've got stuff coming up in Florida, in Houston, Washington, DC, Nigeria. Looks like I might be doing something in Qatar as well in a couple months. So more live events are coming always doing what I'm doing on social media with my podcasting. I'm going to be writing a new book. I'm going to start writing my new book in February. So I'm aiming to have that totally done. I'm, I'm, I'm giving myself a, a shorter deadline. I, I want to have that totally done by the middle of the year, perhaps earlier than that. And uh, I acted in a movie last year called Residuum. Mm. It's not out yet, but the film will be out later on this year. It's a small independent movie, so people can look forward to that. And yeah, that's the stuff right off the top of my head. I'm sure there's more, but um, life is an adventure, man. And I'm doing my best to build my character and to help other people to build their characters and, you know, just inspire and influence in the best way that I can. Uh, I, I love this life. I love people. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy. I'm very grateful. And Lord willing, I can just keep spreading this message and reaching more people with it. Well, Zuby, I, I really have a lot of respect for you and what you're doing and what you're accomplishing. We need people like you who have a very balanced and realistic perspective. Uh, I know you're very thoughtful before you speak. You give it a lot of thought. And we need leaders like you. You are a leader. You know, what, whether you realize it or not, you certainly are. And uh, I wish you continued success. Uh, I hope we get the opportunity to meet one day, speak again. And you got a good supporter here and any way that I can help in any way, you know, just let me know whether it be presenting your music in any way or uh, whatever I could do, you know, I'm a supporter. So I want you to know that. And I appreciate you very much uh, sitting down with me. And like I said, maybe we'll do it again sometime. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michael. I appreciate you. So there you have it. I hope you enjoyed the sit down as much as I enjoyed sitting with him. As you see, he's got a very good perspective on some really important issues. Well thought out, even tempered. We should have more young men like him. This world would be a better place. I suggest you follow him. He's going far. He's already accomplished a lot in his life. So there it is, Zuby. Hope you enjoyed it. And uh, once again, a reminder, on the Amo showroom on uh, the 18th of this month, tickets are still on sale. I think they're just about sold out, but there might be a few more left. Going to have a great night. You know, we do the whole thing, VIP stuff afterwards. I don't have to tell you. It's going to be great. Yes, we do a Q&A, photographs, the whole bit. And then we're having two wine tasting events on the 20th and the 21st in Warren, Michigan. So um, look forward to seeing all my friends in that area. I know a lot of you have contacted me already. So that's it for today. How do I always leave you? Same way. Be safe. Be healthy. God bless every one of you. Yes, God willing. I'll see you all next time. Take care. Thank you.